believe that today, amen. He's able to save, he's able to heal, he's able to deliver, he's able to set the captive free. I believe it this morning. Praise the Lamb of God. Praise God. We've come to, to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today because he's good. He's our creator. I love him this morning with all my heart. He said that he'll inhabit the praises of his people. What kind of praise are you going to give him today? He deserves your highest praise. Your praise creates a throne on which God himself will sit down. What kind of throne are you building with your praise this morning? If faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation. Waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation, and still you know my heart, the author of salvation. You love me from the start. Waiting here for you with our hands lifted. for your father open up the heavens this morning
baby and 17 months later had another baby and so they had 20 month old and a three month old the mom had just gone back to work and the daddy decided it was Mother's Day and the daddy decided that he would take the day and the mom had to work on a Sunday so he said you know what I am going to go and I'm going to let the, the kids give mommy hugs and kisses for Mother's Day take her lunch and so he put good daddy loaded both these kids in the car and he went there and he had to pull in a parking garage and it winded up and he winded up and parked in there took the kids in gave mommy kisses came out the baby was in a pumpkin seat and he put the baby on top of the car and he fastened in the 20 month old and he knew he had errands to run and things to do and he got in the car he started and he took off and he goes down the path there in the parking garage and pulls out on the freeway and at 55 miles an hour hears a screech on top of the car looks out the rearview mirror and sees his baby flying through the air into oncoming traffic now a couple of things with that first of all that baby was okay car seat protected that baby but here's what I want us to notice about that do you think how many here think that that daddy loved that baby Right? A daddy loved that baby. But in the hurry and the rush and the distraction of life, the thing he loved the most, he put into jeopardy. And we live in this society that's a fast food McDonald's society. And we want to rush in and rush out. And, and we even get that way in our relationship with God. And I was at a conference yesterday with my daughter and a mother-daughter conference. And they said this, and it's just burned and etched into my mind and it was this statement hurry is the enemy of intimacy you begin to say the kids say mommy daddy play with me well you know we, we got this to do we got that to do I want to go out on a date with my wife well you know we can go but let's hurry up and eat and let, we got to get back and we got to do this and we got to do that and God says I want to spend time with you I want you to be in my presence okay God well we'll do that but we've got to move on to this and that and and hurry is the enemy of intimacy. And we never really get any true relationship with God, with each other. And so this morning, I just, I know we've got an amazing message that's coming. I'm telling you, it's going to touch your life. But I just want to take a few minutes. And I want us to say, God, I am willing to set some time and distraction and the worries and cares of my day aside and I'm going to take a few more minutes and worship you and as we wait for the presence of God we have some people here that want to be anointed and so I want our elders and our ordained ministers to come we're going to take some time here we're going to pray with some people and we're going to worship God amen so I want if you if you need to be anointed I just want you to come forward right now can I have somebody stand in there was a um a young man that went to OCU, a high Christian university that was hiking and fell off a cliff and, and, and died. Chris, will you stand in? We're going to pray for that family and those kids as well. I don't know if many of you may remember a few weeks ago, Chris stood in for a, a young man that uh, was part of his school. He's an administrator at the schools. And uh, he'd had a four-wheeler accident. They were giving him no hope. Um, tell, tell us about it. been three weeks uh, he's out of ICU he's in uh, they've got him in uh, I don't he's in children's doing rehabilitation and he, he's actually asking for schoolwork now all they're working on is his memory and he's walking he, he's he's come out of it it's amazing it's a miracle. I don't think you heard that did you did you hear that came out of it that day how many know God answers prayer? Come on, you can praise him better than that. God answers prayer. Hallelujah. Waiting. 
reasons, but let me give you one more reason. Let me show you what God is doing in the earth right now. There's a pastor from Pakistan that has been contacting Troy through Facebook. He got in contact with him through a couple other pastors he knows, and he began to, to spark a conversation and a friendship, and, and, and he asked how he could get access to any preaching videos or anything like that, so Troy directed him to YouTube. Just last night, Troy said, you're not going to believe this. I want you to come in here and look at my Facebook, and I want you to see the pictures that he just sent me in my inbox. And in Pakistan, you see outside, they have a big screen set up. And they have hundreds and hundreds of people sitting there. And on that screen, you see none other but in Pakistan, little country preacher, <laughs> Troy Urban. And more than that, the pastor said that 142 people accepted Jesus Christ in Pakistan yesterday. God is God in Pakistan, and God can save anybody anywhere through the power and preaching of the gospel. Amen? Hallelujah. That's exciting. That is exciting. God is moving and doing great things. You may be seated, and I just think that there is no better atmosphere right now to take an offering in than this right here. So ushers, get, take your places right now. This is good soil. This is good soil. When the gospel of Jesus Christ goes forth, and if there is one thing I know about my husband, it is that he stays in prayer that says, God, keep me, keep me strong in the area of the gospel, the good news. Let me preach the Bible, not what people want to hear, but what you say, God. And as the gospel goes forth it, and it goes into the darkness, it always dispels the darkness. Amen? Light always wins. And that's what is happening. You see it happening here. You see it happening in our television ministry in Pakistan. God's moving. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you and we praise you for what you're doing through this ministry. We're humbled. Every one of us are humbled to be used by you. And, God, we just stand today and we declare once again, here am I, God. Here am I. Send me. Use me. Use me to, to accomplish your work, accomplish your will, and do what you want us to do to spread the gospel all over this earth. And we will praise you and thank you for it. Bless the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Life Change Church, we are still in need of volunteers for our VBS coming up in June. So make sure you go to our website, sign up, click on the, on the tab, and you can volunteer. It's going to be an awesome outreach and an awesome week, so make sure you sign up today. Life Change Church, I just wanted to let you know about some product that we have. You know, Pastor Troy just ended the One Series. Man, that was a powerful sermon series. If you missed any part of that sermon series, or if you'd just like to watch it and relive it over again, you need to pick it up today. We have this available in a DVD set and a CD set. It's available at the Welcome Center. Also, and while you're at the Welcome Center, we have several other products. I mean, the praise series that Pastor did a while back, the, the sacrament series that he did over Easter. Those are great, great sermon series that you can get and, and, and relive and listen and watch through those again and, 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 and even share those with your friends and family members. And, and we've got people that buy these and mail them all across the United States to families and, and friends. So pick yours up today. Let me also remind you, last week you know that we had Pastor Will John from Haiti here. I've had a lot of people ask this week if there were still kids that need to be sponsored. Yes, I still have packets, and we will have those available in the foyer this morning. And those of you that did not get a watch, one of the one of the Haiti watches, uh, we have ordered more of those, and they should be in here very, very soon. So stop by the Welcome Center on your way out this morning. I don't know about you, but I appreciate the freedoms that we have in the United States of America. And I appreciate those who have fought 
both in the past and are fighting now for the freedoms that we enjoy. And we are going to honor those who have fought in the past and are fighting now for our freedom at our veteran service on May 19th. You do not want to miss this. If you know a veteran, I want you to invite them to this service so that we can honor them for what they have done for our country. So make sure you're here and invite a veteran on May 19th. There's nothing behind me. All the treasures I used to love, oh, they've all faded from view. But there's a new day ahead for me. Oh, my heartache is over. Yeah. 
There aren't any with no happiness. This could be you. They have no reason for living. I have been there many times. Life has given them broken dreams. Full of sorrow and fear. But listen. you to turn in your Bible this morning to Psalm 146. Psalm 146, we're going to read one verse there, then I want you to flip over to Proverbs chapter 3, a couple very familiar verses of Scripture, verse 5 and 6. Psalm 146 <clears throat> and verse 3, would you stand please in reverence of God's Word. Psalm 146 and verse 3. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. Proverbs chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thee thy paths. We're talking today simply trust. In regards to trust, let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word that is clear. It is poignant, it is powerful. And I pray that each of us today will have ears to hear what the Spirit says. That we would have minds of understanding and hearts that are receptive. I ask today for that special unction, anointing of the Holy Ghost that I recognize and fully, completely realize I need. We have not learned to preach, don't know what to say nor how to say it. I pray that the preacher will come and preach your word. Through this, your servant, use me as a conduit that will bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. You find in the Bible the word trust 188 times. In those verses of Scripture, you will either see the Word of God teaching us what we should trust, or we see clearly what we should not trust. I read to you Psalm 146 verse 3, a verse that teaches us explicitly what we shouldn't trust. He said, do not trust princes or the establishments of government 
for they cannot meet your need. Now, I don't think he's telling us that we ought to think anybody and everybody that's in a government position is a liar. I think what he's saying is even at best they are deficient in solving the problems and bringing to us individually what we truly need. He tells us don't trust or put confidence in man. The fact is men will let you down. Man will fail you. But I want to tell you this morning, God will never fail you. God will never let you down. God is faithful. No wonder the old song says that we ought to stand on the rock and trust him. And even when the winds of adversity blow, and even when the lightning dances across the skies of your life, the rain beats down, he will hold us steady. We can trust him. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. I want you to know you can stand on the rock of your salvation. If you believe it, say amen. So he tells us what we shouldn't trust. The wise man comes along. And in Proverbs chapter 3, he gives us exhortation and encourages us in what we should trust. I want you to know this morning when it comes to confidence and trust, there are some places you can land, you can put confidence in. You can trust God's word. For God's word will never fail. Heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of God will stand forever and forever. You can land on it. You can stand on the promises of God's word. You can look throughout the scripture and find everything God has to say about your life. And I want you to know that in it doesn't matter what you're going through. You can stand on the word of God. The very earth, the foundations thereof are standing on the word of God. No wonder Jesus in response to the temptation from Satan said this, man does not live by bread alone, but he lives by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know the Bible says that God cannot lie. In other words, whatever he says, you can depend on it. You can take it to the bank. You can stand on it. It is a firm foundation. I like that. Paul said to Titus, God cannot lie. I mean he, by his very nature, he cannot lie. If God told a lie, he's so much truth. If God told a lie, it would cease to be a lie as soon as it left his mouth because everything God says happens. Therefore, God cannot lie. It's absolutely impossible for God to lie. If he says it, it's true. If he says it, it's right. If he says it, you can bank on it. If he says it, it's sure. The word of God will stand forever and ever, and you can bank your life on it, and he will never fail you. Whatever God says is right. You can, you can bank on, stand on, trust not only God's word, you can trust and stand on his will. His will. Do you know God knows your name? Uh, he knows your name and furthermore, he spoke your name because if he hadn't, you wouldn't be here this morning. The reason why we're here this morning because God spoke our name. But God knows you, loves you, has a plan and a purpose for you and he has a design. A purpose, his will for you. And when God speaks his will, 
then you can rest in it, settle in it, depend on it, and understand that it doesn't matter what anybody else says at that time. God's will will always come to pass. If God's will for your life is a specific thing, there's nobody, and I mean nobody can stop it. I don't care, he said, don't trust men. I don't care what man says. I know when God called me to preach, there were some that said, not so, not many. But then when I said God wants me to pastor, a lot of people said, no way. He's a preacher. He's an evangelist. He'll never be able to pastor a church. No way. But I knew what God said to me. I knew it was his will. And I've stood on it these last 24 years. And God's always been faithful and provided a place for me to preach and built the church and done great things. And look at this church. God is moving in a great way. Why? Because I know it's God's will and it didn't matter what anybody else said. Preaching good right now. God's will. And God, let me tell you something. Even good people will say the wrong thing. You're not careful. The devil will speak through you. You remember Peter? Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And they said, some say you're Isaiah. Some say you're one of the old prophets. And Peter said, thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. He said, man, you didn't get that from one of your friends. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. He said, you got that revelation from my Father in heaven. But not two or three verses later, Jesus started talking about dying and going to the cross. And Peter said, no, Lord, that's not going to happen. And Jesus wheeled around and said, get behind me. Shut your mouth, Satan. I mean, just a few verses earlier, he was speaking the revelation of God. And then three verses later, he's talking for the devil. Two things there. Number one, don't listen to what everyone's got to say. Secondly, be careful what you say yourself. Parents sometimes make that mistake. They'll hear clearly on God's will for their kid's life, but then they start speaking things that go totally and completely against what God has said. Good people love God, but nonetheless sometimes say the wrong thing. That's why the Bible says you cannot trust man. You trust the will of God. You can trust God's word. You can trust his will. But here's where I want to get. The wise man tells us something else here in Proverbs chapter 3. He tells us that we can trust God's wisdom. There are times that you can't make out a certain scripture that applies. You're just wrestling. There are other times that you can't seem to discern God's will. But when you can't figure it out, you can trust God's wisdom. That's what the wise man was saying in Proverbs chapter 3. Lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the wisdom of God. What I'm saying is there'll be times in your life when there'll be situations and things that you simply can't wrap your mind around. I have lived through hundreds in my life of I don't understand. And as a pastor, I've walked through thousands with people of those I don't understand. I don't understand why she left and not coming back, or he left and not coming back. I don't understand why I went through that divorce. I don't understand why it, I lost my home. I don't understand why my, my, I've lost my job. I don't understand why I'm going through this difficult time. It don't make much sense. I can't wrap my mind around it. I've searched God's word, and I, I don't get it. I, I've listened to what God had to say in his will in my life, and I, I, it doesn't make sense. I cannot figure it out. I don't know why they died. I mean, come on, it doesn't make sense. Why did God take them so early? It makes no sense. I have stood with people a thousand times. And have to admit as a pastor, I don't know. I don't understand. I've wheeled around, stood beside 
little caskets and preach funerals. There sat a broken-hearted mommy and daddy, two, three-month-old baby, beautiful little face, perfect little child. And I, I don't know what to say. I look into their eyes and say, I don't understand either. I don't know why God would allow them to even be born. I don't understand this. I look across the landscape of life and I can see a million things this morning that we just can't figure out the looming question that, that's in our mind. Why? 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 I don't understand. But I am learning, and I say I am learning, that in those moments of life that I, I can't make sense of it and I can't wrap my mind around it and I don't understand it and I can't find it in His Word and I'm struggling with His will, I can always lean on the fact that God knows best. And I can rest in the fact that his wisdom is greater than mine and his decisions are the right decisions. I can lean on that. Job knew what that felt like. He told God, if I could find your throne, I'd walk up to it and fill my mouth with complaints. You remember what happened with Job, wealthiest man in the world? One day, he lost everything. Went from being the wealthiest man to the impoverished. That wasn't bad enough. Wee hours of the morning, there's a knock on the door. He wipes the sleep from his eyes. He opens the door. There stands a friend of his, nervous. He says, I hate to tell you this, but there's been a horrific accident. The roof caved in, and all ten of your children are dead. Seven boys and three girls. I cannot even begin to imagine Job at that funeral, 10 caskets lined up, his entire family. But it happened. That wasn't bad enough. The day after the funeral, he wakes up and from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, putrefying boils, pus filled, and his health is gone. His wife looks at him and says, why don't you just curse God and die? And He said, you talk like a foolish man. But living through that, I don't understand. A just man, God even said he skewed evil. He was a perfect man. And I don't understand why God would put him through that. And Job didn't either. And he said, I would fill my mouth with complaints. I would say to you, I've done what was right. I've listened to your word. I've lived righteously before you. I've been good. I went to church. I paid my tithe. I've been praying. I've not been sinning. I've been living right. I've been witnessing my faith. I'm bringing others to Christ. I'm doing everything I know to do, God. I, don't, I can't figure out why this is happening to me. I'm doing what's right. Have you ever felt like that? Doesn't make sense. And Job said, Lord, I can't even find you. I look in front of me. You're not there. I look to my left and my right and behind me, and I can't find you anywhere. But then faith took hold, and he landed on words like this when he said, even though I don't know where you are, God, I know you know where I am. What was he saying? He was saying, God, I'll trust you. I'll trust that when I can't make sense of it and I don't understand it and I don't know what to do with it, I trust you, God. He said, lean not on your own understanding. How do you trust God? My, how time flies. It's not going very fast for you, is it? How do you trust him? Well, the wise man told us here. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge God. In all your ways. In other words, begin continue and end everything in life with God. I just made a statement that you need to listen to because I think it just passed over some of you. Let me say it again. You begin, continue, and end everything in life with God. How do I trust him? I acknowledge God. In other words, I recognize the fact that I need God. 
not just as a ceremony on Sunday morning or a ritual on Sunday night. I need God on Monday morning and the rest of the week in every single decision I make in life. Most of us live our, our lives as though God doesn't exist. We make a thousand decisions and never even consult our Father. We do all kinds of things and never even, never even question and acknowledge God. And then we wonder why we always end up in a mess. Huh? He said, in all, a L L in all. All my ways, I will acknowledge God. I need God in every decision of life. I trust him by recognizing him in everything. And here's the promise. He said, in all your ways, acknowledge God. And here's what God said he'll do. He said, I will direct your path. When we trust him, he promises he will direct our path. Now, I want to tell you what I used to thought, used to think that meant. I used to think that meant I come to the fork in the road in life. Or maybe there's two or three paths to take. I'm standing there, I could go this path, I could take that path, I could take that path. And I'm not sure which one to take. And I seek God and acknowledge God and pray and ask the Lord. And then God reveals to me what path to take. I used to think that. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I believe it's a little deeper than that. I was reading old Moffat one day, and he talked about the fact, and I agree with him, when you look it up in the original Hebrew, it really means this. Life is a wilderness, and there's no path. More times in my life, there's never... I. I I kind of like that. Well, it'd be nice to have a couple paths to choose from. Most of the time, I'm standing there in the middle of a wilderness, and I don't know what to do because there ain't no path in front of me. I mean, I, I, I ain't got nowhere to turn. It'd be nice, well, I could do this or I could do that. Most of the time, I say, I don't know what to do. Am I the only one this morning? I don't know what to do. And he said, here's what it means that, that God will direct your path. He will get in front of you. When you're in this wilderness of life and there's no path, he will get in front of you and like a bulldozer in the wilderness, he'll make a road. No wonder the Bible says the Spirit of God was on John to prepare the way. What was he saying? He said he's going he's to bring up every low place and bring down every high place and build a road, build a highway in the wilderness. What God says he'll do for us is when we trust him and put confidence in him and put faith in him in the midst of life when there is no way, he'll get in front of us and bulldoze everything down and make a way where there is no way. Praise the Lord. When it seems impossible, God said, I'll make it possible. When everything's wrong, I'll make it right. When things are low, I'll bring them up. When things are high, I'll bring them down. When there's something in the way, I'll move it out of the way. Must have been how Moses felt when he and the children of Israel stood at the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his army and behind been on their destruction. And he said, stand still. Acknowledge God. Trust God. And he'll make a way. And he opened up the Red Sea. Oh, hallelujah. And they walked across on dry land. I want to tell you, God will make a way for you. Woo! Hallelujah! God will make a way. God will make a way. It seems impossible right now in your home, but God will make a way. Seems impossible in your finances, but God will make a way. Seems impossible in your emotions, but God will make a way. The doctor gave you a bad report, but God will make a way. The bills are coming due, but God will make a way. My children have run off and they're astray. God will make a way. I'll say hallelujah to his name. Trust him. Trust him. 
trust him. Trust him. He will make a way for you. Woo! What am I going to do? Trust God. How am I going to get through? Trust God. What's it mean to trust? What it means to trust is this. It means to put all your weight on. Some of you trust the chair you're sitting on more than you do God. Someone bring me a chair. One of you ushers bring me a chair. But don't all of you move at once now. <laughs> Thank you, brother. He's going to bring me his own chair. That's the kind of man he is. Bless your heart, Ted. He's bringing me his own chair. All right, I want to make sure you had a place to sit. <laughs> What's it mean to trust God? It means it's like I trust this chair. When I sit on it, it's going to hold up all <laughs> 175 pounds. <laughs> it's going to hold up all 195 to, to 200, right, right around there, give or take, depending on how much pizza I ate that week. It's going to hold up all 200 pounds. And I sit on a chair every day, just like you do, and never even give it a thought. It's going to hold me up. I've sit on a few, and it didn't hold me up. You ever have that happen? <laughs> what it means to trust God, say, God, in life, in every situation, I'm going to put all my weight. I'm not going to put the weight on my shoulders. I'm not going to put the weight on the pastor's shoulders. I'm not going to put the weight on Obama's shoulders. Huh? I'm going to put the weight, all of it, on you. And I'm going to believe that you are going to hold me up. Listen, if I had time this morning to talk about how many times God has held me up. I'm reminded of Moses. His hair had blossomed for eternity. The lines of his brow were deepened with the plows of time. His shoulders were stooped. And his steps were heavy. He was an old man. He came down to the close of his life. And he stood before the children of Israel. He looked at the elders and he said, Listen, you're going to go out in the future there a little ways. And you're going to run into some problems. But he said, Always remember this. Always remember the eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. What's he saying? He's saying when you're low, God will get under you and he'll lift you up. He'll hold you steady no matter what's going on. Trust him. Trust him. My mama gave me the other day, it's a couple weeks ago now, a wallet. It was my daddy's wallet from years ago. When he passed away, she kept my dad's wallet. She handed it to me and inside the wallet was... His, his passport, army, army passport when he went in World War II, 1941. Still there and intact. It's interesting to see it. And then she left, put a couple dollars in there. Because when he passed away when I was 13 years old, we went for months. I mean, we didn't have anything to begin with, but then we went for months with nothing, no income to, to speak of. Mama didn't have a job. She raised kids. Dad provided. When he died, we literally had nothing. We had no idea how we were going to eat, let alone pay for the house, the car, whatever. We had no idea. My mom is, she, is who she is, and there's a lot of things I've learned from her, but there's one thing I know I learned from my mama. That's how to trust God. Amen. She trusted God through all that. And this is the truth. The house was paid. The car was paid for. 
we had plenty to eat, and you can tell I've not gone hungry in my life. And she had that little wallet, and the whole six months that the, we were going through retirement red tape, the whole six months, that wallet not one time ever went completely empty. A couple times it got down to one dollar, but it was never completely empty. And mom kept trusting God and trusting God and trusting God, and he provided every step of the way. That's the truth. And I want to tell you, the God that held the world in place and part of the Red Sea, brought Hebrew boys through fire, the God that sent his son and provided the way of salvation, that God will take hold of your life and lift you and carry you through the times that you don't understand and you don't know how you're going to make it. And you'll get out on the other end of that thing and say, I don't know how he did it, but bless his name, he did it. He did it. Trust him. Trust him. Stand with me, please. I wonder who this morning would say, I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I don't know him as my Lord. But I need God in my life. Or maybe there's someone here this morning that would say, I've been saved. But, but I've been going through some stuff. I need, I need, I need to pray today. I just need some folks to pray with me because I, I need lifted. I need, to, I need to know that his arms are underneath me. As we sing, if you feel the Holy Spirit tug at your heart, I'm going to invite you to come and we'll pray with you at the close of this service. Go ahead and sing. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise thank you jesus just to know who would come thus said the lord jesus jesus how i trust No, sing it. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for every person at the altar. You know what they're going through. You know what they're facing, God. You know what they need. And I pray that they'll feel those everlasting arms underneath them. I ask God that they would know they can stand upon your word and trust your will and know that your wisdom is true. You will not fail them. I pray that as we leave this place that your spirit would go with us. Would you guide us and give, the, give us the strength and faith to follow? Thank you for all the answered prayers that you give us every day and be, being with us through everything every day. I pray that you'll continue to be with us. We trust you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget church tonight at 6 o'clock.